after all. <laughs> I write all this shit and then I have to get it. Thanks for tuning in to edition, special edition, the Run Show Report. Murray, I reported from the city, too tough to die, New London. And we're honored and privileged, certainly today, because our guest is Congressman Joe Courtney. And um, Joe, I got to tell you, uh, we met over 17 years ago. That's right. And I've I've come to think of you not as my congressman, but as a friend, because uh, you're very open to everybody. And uh, uh, every time I've called up there, your crew helps us. And by the way, you got a tremendous operation up there. Everybody's very happy, helpful. And uh, we met Manny today. Uh, and. Just, just a great operation you got there. But so I was telling Manny, who, uh, by the way, does all our veterans and military casework in the office, but that um, this was the last TV show I did before the election in 2006 when I won by 83 votes. 83, Joe. And, and uh, we think we found him You're when I was on that show. And you've always remembered it, and I thank you for coming back <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to give us an uh, update on what's sure. going on. And certainly you're busy because it's, more like a circus-like atmosphere, and uh, becomes more and more ridiculous. Seems like as years, as time goes by. Right. It, I, I'm getting older. Not you're not, but uh, we're, we're tired. But bring us up to speed uh, where you see things happening and where we're headed. So um, I mean, I look at uh, everywhere I go. People ask me, you know, how can you stand it, and you know, are, are, you know, is the country going to be okay? Wow. And And um, you know, so you're, not alone. so you're not alone. Um, and, the, you know, the good news is, <clears throat> in my opinion, you know, we, we did a lot of good things in the last two years in terms of, you know, finally passing an infrastructure bill, you know, getting uh, prescription drugs, you know, uh, in a place where the government can negotiate lower prices. Uh, and that's already happening with insulin. And there will be 10 other medications on the list this year. Um, you know, I, I think the... Um, investments in, in green energy tax credits, which we can see, you know, right here in New London, you know, with the offshore wind turbines that are now arriving uh, for assembly uh, is going to be a good thing for both, you know, the environment and jobs and, and um, you know, stabilizing our energy and electricity supply here. Uh, and obviously the big one in the area is uh, the Navy's budget for submarines. Uh, Kevin Graney, uh, back in uh, January, announced the hiring goal for electric boat this calendar year, 2023, of 5,750 people in one year. They, they hired just shy of 4,000 uh, last year. Um, I went down to their walk-in Wednesday job fair every, every Wednesday, you know, on East Point Road there um, at, from 12 to 4. Anyone can just walk in. And, and, you know, with a resume if they got it or just to find out questions or sometimes they hire people right there on the spot. As of the end of July, the uh, EB has hired uh, 3,200 3, people this calendar year already. So they're on target to actually hit Kevin's uh, goal by the end of December. That's the biggest number in the history of the company, which is 120 years old. It's they, even during World War II. They didn't hire that many people in one calendar year. So, um, you know, that's a pretty amazing sort of event that's going on right here, you know. And, um, and, and I think, you know, you're seeing its ripple effect in terms of new housing, which you and I were just looking out the back door of the building here today in Waterford. But it's happening in New London. It's happening in New Norwich, you know, where, where new housing is, is uh, you know, going up because obviously the population is growing here. So. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff that's going on. On the other hand, you know, you've got a very um, unstable majority right now in the House where there's a small group of Freedom Caucus members who almost, um, you know, took the country to the brink in terms of the debt ceiling. We, we literally got it done with hours to spare. And now October 1 is approaching, which is, uh, you know, we have to fund the government because the federal fiscal year starts on October 1. Uh, yesterday, the 20 members of the Freedom Caucus said that they would oppose uh, bringing up a continuing resolution, which is usually the stopgap to keep the government from shutting down. Um, that's a very um, alarming uh, announcement on their part because McCarthy, in my opinion, could find votes in our caucus to keep the government open. But every time he does that, um, it, it just makes that group 
angrier and angrier. And under the rules he accepted last January, it, it, can, it all it takes is a small group to to uh, do a motion to vacate the speaker's chair. So it's going to be pretty dicey, you, honestly. You know, you must have been reading my notes because I got off the computer before before we met. The announcement that uh, the House Freedom Caucus is demanding uh, whatever they are, right. and, and we're, we're already talking about another government shutdown, which leads me into a question I, I was afraid to ask you, but now, now that you're talking no, about I'm going to ask you. Every year, you've been there 17 years now, 18 years now. Every Not you, but right. this has been going on forever. Every year, our government kicks the can down the road with very important issues. This being probably the most important right. because uh, they, they, they threaten the economy of the United States and our well-being every year. And whether it's IRS, whether it's police protection, any issue, you kick the can down the road. We're tired of that joke. We want some action. We want some problems solved. But we wait to the last minute in the 11th hour every year is, is what's going on here. So here's the good news. So in the Senate, who I usually do not, you know, uh, praise very often, they've actually moved their spending bills to keep the government open on a bipartisan basis. And, and basically they got, a, they got them all out of committee on a bipartisan basis. If they put that on the floor of the House tomorrow, I mean, I'd fly down to Washington and join, I think, a majority of Democrats and Republicans to get that done and, and stop torturing people with the last minute sort of, um, you know, run up of the clock. Again, the problem McCarthy has is that when in January, when he had the 15 votes before he finally, you know, got elected speaker, he, he gave away, um, you know, his authority by basically saying, you know, it only takes one or two people in his caucus to bring a motion to vacate. I mean, if you go back and remember, Boehner got booted out by his, his own people. Paul Ryan got booted out by his own people. You know, people like to criticize Nancy Pelosi and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, you know, she operated under a different set of rules where it took a larger group to do a motion to vacate. McCarthy just can totally, totally conceded that back in January. And... You know, I, I mean, he did it because he needed to get these people's votes to, to get elected speaker. But as I said, I, you know, the, it's really the ball is in his lap in terms of whether or not he will allow us to get these bipartisan spending bills to the floor and just get it done so that we do have stability in the Navy's budget and in the IRS's budget and in, you know, the Department of Justice for cops grants and all that other stuff. But I, I, I don't know what he's going to do because, uh, as you point out, the Freedom Caucus basically threw down the gauntlet yesterday. You mentioned Nancy Pelosi. Do you have any uh, feelings about term limits? Uh, what, what do you think should have I me? Mean, she's 100 years old, Joe. She's not, but she's, uh, and, and I, I would just say this. I mean, there was a lot of people who were uh, complaining that she, you know, shouldn't have run for speaker again. But during the last Congress, she got the infrastructure bill done. She got the um, you uh, give her, uh, rescue You plan. give her credit? You know, what? you can America? say everything you want about her, but when, when it comes to the job of speaker, which is lining up votes and keeping the lights out, we did not have a government she shutdown. She had a great book out, you know. Uh, I haven't seen that, yeah. actually. So, um, and, I, you know, I, I think um, she defied the laws of gravity. <laughs> is she, <laughs> you know? she going to run for speaker again? No. No, no, no. Hakeem Jeffries is not oh, the, okay. the, the new head of the caucus, who, who I actually brought to Groton with We me. use this show to announce your candidacy <laughs> in the upcoming uh, 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 2024 election. I mean, right now I'm, I'm operating under the assumption that I'm running. We have but breaking I, but news I, but here. We today, don't, but I, I'm not prepared to make that, that, that black and white in us. <laughs> All right, let's get to... It's still early. Let's get to yep. serious business here. Yep. Is there an end to Ukraine? Uh, I mean, my God, 2023, Joe... We're still killing each other? Yeah. What the hell is going on? Well, again, Putin, in my opinion, is still the most, he's the responsible party. He, he invaded a country that, uh, again, the world recognized its borders, and, um, but a great loss to his own people. He has lost 120,000 Russian soldiers in, in this invasion. Um, How many has Ukraine lost? It's uh, less than half of that. 
And again, they're fighting for their country. The, Colonel the Russians, McGregor disputes that. Well, I, I, I think he's definitely outside of, uh, you know, consensus opinion. Fifty-four countries have come together as part of the coalition to help Ukraine in various ways. I mean, obviously, the U.S. is is, is the biggest supporter in terms of military assistance, but. Um, you know, you've got countries like Korea and Japan, uh, Australia, who um, are, are contributing to this because they see, you know, what's at stake here in terms of, um, you know, international rule of law. The good news is uh, just in the last few days, particularly in the southern um, battlefront that really Ukraine is seeking to break through because that would cut off the Russian forces um, along that southern um, you know, part of the, that borders on the Black Sea, and um, which is down along here. Th that's really, I think, the, where uh, if there's going to be a breakthrough um, in the warm weather, that's you know now only got a couple months left. That's that's the area to to really pay attention to. We get briefed on this stuff on armed services. Now, now all yesterday, the time. there was a news flash that uh, the Biden administration urging U.S. citizens in Belarus to depart the country. Immediately, right. What's going on that, on the other side of that, and and uh, how serious of a threat? I mean, it's got to be something there to. For that yeah, no. I mean, so the, I mean, so the Belarus um, dictator, in my opinion, uh, he he stole the election there a couple of years ago. Uh, has that's been, what, he's, that's he's, what Trump said. <laughs> well, in Belarus, there was no question about it. I mean. Uh, uh, but in any case, I mean, he's been the strongest ally for Putin from day one. And Russian, Russian troops are in Belarus right now. It, it, it's just north of Ukraine. And um, so far, you know, the, the president of Belarus is saying he's not going to use his troops to invade um, Ukraine. But he, um, you know, he, in my opinion, if, if I had a family member who was in Belarus, I'd tell him to get out of there. I think, I think the, the State Department was right to do that. You know, Joe, you know your geography. I had to bring this map because you know, I didn't do that well. And uh, it all gets back to you. Know, my father was in the Navy, and we travel around a lot. It all gets back to my training, so I got yeah. on my cheat sheet here. Uh, it's a serious threat, but we we need to have this over with. Why? We need to be working together, Joe. And, uh, and, and you know, I tell these young kids, too, you got, you got to be sitting over there. You guys got to hurry up and take over because we screwed this up pretty good. Yeah, I, I have to say, though, I mean, Nobody expected Putin to be this crazy to, to start a war. And, and you look at the, 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 um, <clears throat> the ripple effect. So Finland and Sweden, which have been neutral countries up in, in the Scandinavia area there, because they border uh, uh, Russia, particularly Finland, that's there. They never joined NATO. They, they had a strict policy of neutrality. After Putin invaded Ukraine, the the parliaments of both Sweden and, and Finland, after 75 years of saying no to NATO, voted to join NATO because they realized how dangerous uh, Putin is. I visited uh, Finland a year ago last July with the Armed Services Committee. We, we were along the border there, which again, there's about 1,800 mile border with Russia. Um, and, uh, and we met with some members of parliament from Finland. I was a young woman there from the Green Party that was there, and I said to her, so did you vote to, to join NATO? And she said, absolutely, yes. And I said, well, the Green Party in the U.S., they hate NATO. I mean, that's pretty amazing that she did it. She goes, well, when you share a border with Vladimir Putin, that makes you very pragmatic. And, um, and, and so, you know, all Putin has done is really hurt Russia. A million people have emigrated out of Russia, some of the brightest, youngest, uh, talented people said, I I'm out of here. And, and, and he's, he's, the loss of human life in terms of his own uh, army has just been really just catastrophic. So do you have any sense of how long this thing, I mean, who would ever think it would have gone I, on you know, I this honestly, long? I honestly think the next two or three months is pretty critical in terms of, you know, uh, Zelensky knows it too, that they have to show some progress here um, or there really is going to be some pressure um, brought to bear about trying to um, come up with some kind of solution to this because it's been very disruptive to the energy markets, you know, obviously, um, and, you know, the grain um, exports out of Ukraine, which, you know, the world depends on in terms of feeding people. Yeah, I never That's realized it. that. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's the breadbasket of Europe. That, they say that the earth over there 
It's so fertile, you go down eight feet, and it's, it's all rich. Uh, no, it's, it's an amazing place, actually. And, um, but, you know, I, there's a Ukrainian church up in Willimantic. Audrey and I go to mass there every once in a while. The priest um, is an immigrant from, from Ukraine, Lviv, which is in the western part of Ukraine. It used to be in Poland, and, you know, that stuff all goes back and forth all the time. But anyway, um, those people there are, 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 you know, the salt of the earth. You know, they're Ukrainian Americans up in the Wyndham area there. And um, I, I mean, they are terrified that um, the West is going to give up and, and, you know, their families are going to be sort of subject to, to Putin. I know I'm jumping all over. That's but all right. I, did you want to say anything else about the veterans, the, the PACT Act or the uh, TRICARE? Sure. So area? the PACT, real quick. So the PACT Act was signed into law a year ago, last August. Again, it, it's the toxic exposure bill for both veterans who served in, during the Vietnam War, but also Iraq and Afghanistan. Again, if, if you, and you know this well, Agent Orange, which was that um, dioxin that they were spraying out there to kill all the vegetation, um, despite everything that the military told the soldiers who were spraying this stuff, it was poison. And it caused a whole host of, of ailments, again, cancers, heart disease, diabetes, skin ailments, and it took really almost 30 years to get the VA to finally admit that this stuff was all connected to that exposure. Uh, we finally got the law changed so that all you had to show was if you served in Vietnam at such and such a date and you got this illness, that's it, you're, you're, you're covered. But the problem was a lot of other countries in the area, you know, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Guam, uh, Thailand, where people were also over there and that stuff was sloshing around, they weren't covered by that. PACT Act picked them all up. And, and Manny helped a couple guys uh, right off the bat who, um, you know, qualified because, but they were in Thailand, they weren't in, in Vietnam. Same thing for toxic exposure in the Middle East. Again, those burn pits where they just were throwing everything in there with, you know, tires and plastics and stuff and everything like that, uh, same problem was happening. People were coming home with really bad uh, sicknesses. Again, um, they all got picked up. And again, it's probably about a dozen countries uh, in the Middle East, Kuwait, you know, Qatar, um, you know, who um, were picked up by the PACT Act. And the nice thing is, is that the enrollment process was really easy. Uh, Manny was part of a, a group that organized a, an enrollment session up in Norwich at Rally Point, which is up in the industrial park there, Easter Seals beautiful veterans facility that's there. We had 200 veterans that showed up one morning. Ray Hackett, remember Ray from, uh, I'm, I'm from not, Norwich Bowl? He lives in, he lives, yeah, he, I, it was the first time I'd seen him in ages. He's in Niantic. Yeah, I call him. That me. was there. The 200 veterans there, 75 of them were enrolled right there on the spot, and the rest of them are there working through. And again, because it, it's quick, it's easy. But yeah, Ray was there. Oh, too. I miss him. Yeah. Well, he I'll was tell him you said so. so. He, he, he was so knowledgeable. I've yes. him a couple. He must be mad at me for that last election. He's enjoying we never retirement. Anything, <laughs> by the way. Um, let's t uh, switch. By the way, people can still qualify for it. Just in, in, if they have questions, call my office in Norwich. Manny yeah, doesn't appreciate that. Well, I just did that well, we'll get a cell phone number after you. He'll appreciate it. He'll appreciate it less when we get done with Manny. Uh, strengthening the economy, uh, what do you say about that, Joe? But before you answer the question, I, wa I want to ask you, Did you have you been to the store lately? I have. Okay. Yep, and, and prices are still tough and, and, and hard, and particularly food prices. I filled up this morning. You know, it was 370, um, so the gas prices are kind of creeping back up again. That's there. We don't like that, Joe. No, I don't like that either, but remember, a year ago, it really, it was June of 2022, it was $4.98 was the average that price That doesn't in make me feel any better at all. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, um, if you talk to, and I have a somewhat of a unique ex experience in Washington because of that AUKUS submarine deal, where I, the British Embassy and the Australian Embassy, they're in my office a lot there. Inflation in, in, the, in Great Britain right now is 6.8%. I, mean, I don't and, care. And, well, if, if you look at, where we are with all the G7 countries, which are you know Western market economies, we have the lowest inflation rate of all the G7s, and and but we got to we got to bring it down more. I get it, and and um, you know the fact that people are paying still um, more for chicken or how do we do burger, that, Joe? Well, I, you know the um, 
there, there still are supply chain problems. There, there really still is out there, and that's oh. that that is improve that's improving. I I I beg to differ, Joe. Oh, no, and, I, and, I think and, there and, really and is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you okay. why. Okay, I was in the plumbing business. Yep. A part that used to cost me forty dollars, now they're charging us a hundred and forty dollars. It's not supply chain, it's greed. And they're taking us to the cleaners. Whether you're buying a car or whether you're buying a boiler, we're getting screwed. They blame it on supply chain. They blame it on inflation, but it's greed. So, I mean, let's take lumber, okay, for now. Because when, when the inflation was at 9% a year ago, it was $1,500 $1, per 100, you know, whatever they, they use for the measurement there, which is insane amount of cost. Today, it's, un, it, it's dropped by two-thirds that's happened there. And, and so, you know, eggs, again, they, they were crazy, you know, because of avian flu and, you know, other sort of egg-specific issues there where those prices have come back down. Again, I was with the dairy farmers yesterday, um, milk selling for $17 per hundred weight, which has definitely uh, come down from where it was. Um, it was over $20 per hundred weight that's there. So, um, you know, the good news is we had some, some buffers for people. Social Security went up 8.7% this year, the COLA. That's the second biggest increase in the history of Social Security. I've been to a lot of senior centers and there's no question that that helped people. Medicare um, Part B premium, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the premium that you pay out of your Social Security check, that actually went down. So that ended up with a net bigger cash in hand. Well, it did. And, and Joe, I, I'm on Social Security. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I'm making more money, it seems like I'm getting less money. But, but that, not last year, because the premium went down. That, that they deduct from, from Social Security. And, and, I, and I will tell you, as far as the prescription drugs is concerned, um, you know, the U.S. pays two and a half times you know, more for prescription drugs than every, everywhere else in the world here. And you know, that's outrageous, because that's, that's greed, where that's just going straight to the pharmaceutical companies. We cut insulin to $35 a month. I have friends who are on Medicare and, and use insulin that, that's a two-thirds reduction in terms of how much they had to pay for, for a life, you know, you have to have it. Isn't it due to the fact, a lot of that, that the pharmaceutical companies have been screwing it? Oh yeah, totally. Insulin's been off patent for over 100 years. You know, and, and the guy who in, invented it or discovered it, he actually sold the patent for $1 because he said he didn't want to make money off it because he, he, he wanted to help people and instead, you know, some There's no easy solution to these problems. Well, I, I actually think that, you know, ha having the Medicare program negotiate lower prescription drugs, just like we do with the VA, is a solution. And, and Why don't they take the dental? Well, we, we, we almost got it over the finish line last time. It, 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 dental's expensive. You're not kidding. Yep. There's and, no check. You know, you know how you know you're in trouble when you go to the dentist? When you walk in the door and you see three girls doing the files, you're in trouble. Yep. And, and th th they, they got caught blanche. But really, for Medicare to expand dental coverage, because there's that eyeglasses and hearing aids, you know, which is the, thing, the three that we were looking for. <laughs> okay, you didn't get any of them, did you? N nope. And, um, you know, we should have gotten hearing aids, because that's like actually... You're telling that's, me. That, but that's, and that's actually a very manageable cost for Medicare. Um, but, you know, the other side doesn't want to help us with that. Bernie Sanders, you know, ha was the guy who was pushing that up in the Senate. He wants Medicare for all, and then it came down to hearing, dental, and, uh, uh, and eyeglasses, and, and um, you know, we came up short. We just need, we need more votes. So for, um, you know, the, the Build Back Better, which you may remember, that was the big package that ended up getting really shrunk that was there. We had the votes in the House, but they could not get to 60 votes in the Senate, because that's what you need to overcome and is it a filibuster. A, a bar bargaining chip? Because there's no common sense, in, there's very little common sense in, in what you do in, in Washington. Well, I, I actually think what we did for insulin was a very good common sense thing to do. That drug... For, in what? For, for insulin. For insulin, insulin yeah. Yes. No, I mean, and, no, and, and frankly, you know, the, what we should have done also was extend the $35 per month uh, cap for working age Americans, not just people on Medicare. And we passed that out of the House. 
and it got and, and it came up one vote short in the Senate to get to the 60 vote threshold. Mm. We lost Mansion or Cinema uh, up there. So, um, but you know, now that people are seeing that the insulin is actually affordable for people on Medicare, I think we're going to get that. We're we're going to get that extension to to regular insurance. I'll tell you what ticks me off is that the insurance companies who sell group health insurance and employer health, they didn't help us at all in terms of trying to, to get that lower um, cost just for insulin. Um, because, and, and that would have helped their customers. And why do you think uh, they did Because it's, at the end of the day, you know, honestly, that's just not their priority. And it's, and it's sad to say is that they, they're more concerned with, um, you know, their own sort of um, premiums and, and, and that as opposed to actually trying to get to the heart of the matter which is lowering health care costs. Who's your uh, closest ally um, in, con in Congress? Who do you uh, I got a bunch of, of guys that are there. I mean on the Armed Services Committee uh, the Republican counterpart that I have is guy Trent Kelly from Mississippi. He was uh, he's, he's a guy that came up. Yeah, he's a super guy. He's, he's a, a general in the Mississippi National Guard. We, we actually co-sponsor a number of bills together, um, and he's just a really good person. Audrey and I have traveled with him and his wife, Sheila. Um, so he's, he's and you know, it defies all the conventional wisdom that we don't talk to Republicans, because Trent and I are buddies, you know. And, um, uh, but you know, in the delegation here, John Larson, you know, I've known John forever, and um, you know, I've known his family, and you know, we talked to him yesterday, you know, um, and we text each other all the time. You, know, you, me you mentioned, one of my favorite guys, Manson. How do you get along with him? So um, I, I don't know him that well because he's, you know, when you're in the House and the Senate, it's, it really is like you're in, in a different universe at times that's there. I mean, I actually think he came around on a couple of measures like the insulin. Um, and, um, but I think he, he could have helped some more. I mean, like this nonsense uh, that Bob talked about where that senator from Alabama who's held up three, 300 um, military pro uh, promotions. We do not have a commandant of the Marine Corps. We now do not have a chief of naval operations in the Navy because this one guy is blocking the, the nom mm -hmm. these nominees who are not controversial. The people, everybody agrees, they're, they're good the, people. He's the, th the thing, Joe, that, that makes me think that our system's not working. Well, the, I, I agree that the, the rules of the Senate, were, which allow one senator to block a nomination, has to be changed, and that's and that is systemic. You know that that has to. You know that's not just um, you know one guy. But it's that, so hard to make change. And and um, and that that's the thing that concerns me in terms of people. You know, kind of losing heart uh, about our, our political system. Can we, we talk about renewable energy? Sure. Because uh, are you a proponent? Of I am. So. Let's talk about the solar uh, scam that's going on. Uh, these guys are tremendous salesmen, by the way. When they come to your house, they want you to sign right there on a computer, which for old people is very difficult to do. I think it's a scam. Uh, the, the short, just shorten it up. He designed a system for me, and I says, and you can either buy it or rent it. Right. I said, well, how much if I if I buy it? Seventy thousand, seventy thousand um, dollars. But I, if I buy it, I get the tax credit. If I don't, I don't get the. It's so complicated, right. and uh, I, I just don't understand that. I'm not ready to go. I'm not ready to go for another. Well, I'm glad, to, I'm glad you, you held off because uh, first of all, there's a very uh, active market out there right now with lots of um, you know different uh, installers that are that realize that these tax credits are really a good deal for the homeowner. Yeah, and, but you have to buy it to get well, the tax credit. I mean, or, but, the, but the lease um, arrangement, you're still getting the benefit of the tax credit because that sort of gets passed along to you by the installer who- You have who, it on your house, yet? I do, and, we, and Audrey and I paid for it. We, we, we put up the, the money. We didn't pay $70,000. That, that's a very high number. I don't understand that number at all. Um, but um, it, and it's really had a very beneficial effect on our, our um, electricity bill. What's your electric bill? It's about 100 a month, you know, even, I, even, even during the peak of you know, the I, increases. I never had any luck uh, uh, getting a hold of Senator Needleman. Remember you told me to call yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. But I'm, I, I didn't you should make, have him on, actually. I, really. I would love to have yeah, him I'll, on. I'll, I'll mention it to Norm. Would you? Yeah. Um, let, um, get back to re yes, renewables. Right. Uh, 
how about the windmill project? Right. I know that you're a proponent of it. Um, sometimes it makes sense to me, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Can you educate? So me first on of that? all, offshore wind, because that's what it is here. I mean, there's windmills that are in you know land based all over the country right now, but offshore wind, which is what's happening right here in New London is a really mature technology. They've had them in Europe now for 20 years. I mean, and they're off the you know, coast of the Great Britain, Denmark, you know, a lot of other countries. Um, it is renewable. It's a, it, it does not emit carbon, which right now I think is really something we have to do as a country and as a world is to decarbonize um, energy production. And, um, uh, and the in investment tax credits um, which were created before Biden, uh, actually Trump um, signed one of the extensions of the investment tax credits, is what is helping finance um, those turbine um, blades that just got dropped off at State Pier, as well as the, uh, you know, the assembly towers that are happening there. So, you know, uh, that is stimulating, you know, the, the expansion of these, um, these, you know, this technology that's here. Once those things get assembled, and people are going to, in my opinion, be blown away when they see the size of these things, you know, right there on State Pier, because they're going to stack them up on top of each other. The the different, those, you see those tubes mm. sitting there uh, horizontal. Mm. They're going to be vertical, and then they're going to bring the. They're blades. going to assemble them there. They're going to assemble them right there, and then they're just going to barge them right out to off. Uh, the first ins installation is off of uh, South Fork. They tell me that some of those are three hundred feet. No, they're, they are massive. And the blades um, on these things, which if you go to my um, campaign, or my uh, not my campaign, my office website, we, we were walking around them the other I day. I it again, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> You're an eagle eye. Um, but anyway, I mean, these things, um, they're going to assemble them out there off the South Fork. That first, inst that first group of towers, they're, they're going to feed electricity into Long Island. The second group is going to go off of Rhode Island those are going to feed into Connecticut. The power is going to feed into Connecticut. It's about 300,000 homes uh, equivalent in terms of megawattage, and the same thing for, uh, for Rhode Island that's there. And they are going to be building, assembling those turbines. When you say they, who are you referring to? Well, it's, uh, it's Orsted um, is the Danish company. Never saw it got up. They're, they're, they're about to bail. You know, they're not really into energy production as much as energy transmission, so that's not that big of a surprise, in my opinion. Um, but the bottom line is, is that, that that, along with the nuclear power plant over in, in Waterford, Connecticut is going to have a very strong clean energy portfolio in, in a pretty short period of time. So you're, you're, you, you being a proponent of, of yeah. this technology is, is the fact that it's clean energy. It's clean energy, and we know it's reliable. I mean, so I'd rather have nuclear. Well, I, look, at, I, I'm a proponent of nuclear as well. I mean, because there's no question. Again, you look at, and we talked about this off camera. Forty percent of the power, over forty percent, really, in Connecticut comes from the nuclear power plant in, in Waterford. You know, that's a nineteen. It's like over forty percent of the state's energy is generated in that one site. It's a pretty extraordinary mm. statistic that's there. And, um, you know, that technology was 1970s, 1980s technology. It creates spent nuclear fuel, which we're still got to figure out a solution to that. I will say this, the Biden administration, Department of Energy, has been really succeeding with a new siting process where they now have uh, 13 different places around the country that have actually responded to an inquiry about whether they'd be interested in, in being um, a storage place for this stuff. It's going to take a little longer before that comes so together. So if this technology is so good, why does it have to be subsidized to work? Well, I mean, honestly, everything, the oil companies got subsidies coming out of their ears. The oil depletion allowance, I mean, Bob can probably walk through some of these right you know, here, but manufacturing tax credits, the oil industry got a ton of subsidies that's here. It's new tech, it's a new investment. I mean, really historically, if you look at the railroads that were built in the US, canals, you know, all the major sort of infrastructure investments, the government was there to help sort of jumpstart. Yeah. So my friend Harry Manzaris, staunch Democrat yeah. from Groton, you know, uh, we, we talk and uh, 
he came up with this idea about EB mass producing reactors to produce electricity. Would you consider? Would you consider push pushing to to? to so Not that, only would I consider it, I have so that EB gets the same incentive. Or, yes. Or so anybody for so that, again that, that, that they're given to so the windmill technology. So if you look at the infrastructure bill as well as the. Um, tax credits that were in the Inflation you Reduction Act. You look at it, you can't understand it. <laughs> okay, but take it from me. There, there was um, money and, and tax incentives for modular nuclear power, okay, which is, is the it smaller. Equal to, is it equal to that? Absolutely, and Dominion is, is, is moving forward on this. Bill Gates is actually investing in modular nuclear power, and that guy, you know, knows how to make a buck. Okay, so, you know, th this is a very active, area right now in terms of research and development of modular units, which again, produce less waste and, and re do not require as much water in terms of uh, running the, the system, which obviously the, the plant in, in Waterford requires water. That's why it's built where it is um, that's there. And um, General Dynamics, which is, the mass, yes, is, is, is definitely very, very much um, engaged in terms of pursuing this. So, so he's right. and. Um, and actually, the, the General Assembly in Hartford uh, passed a bill to allow modular to be actually sited at the, at the Dominion uh, property, which is about six or 700 acres there. So, um, you know, it's going to take this the stuff is not ready to, for prime time yet in terms of building and, and hooking things up. But it's, it's, I think it's coming. I, I, I think what you're saying, Joe, is that what we should have been doing, we didn't do. And now we're in the 11th hour. Um, well, first of all, there was a lot of people who were denying climate change for a long time. We didn't want to do anything and just felt like we should just stay with oil and gas and, and fossil fuels. Oh, by the way, speaking of oil and gas, yeah. uh, Governor, Governor Lamont just uh, proposed a uh, moratorium on sale of gas-powered vehicles. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that seems unconstitutional to me. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's basically putting Ford Motor Company and the rest of them out of business with the internal combustion motor. I'm appalled. I know those crazy people in California do it, but we're following suit with that. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Can I, I mean, I, personally, I feel we should be focused right now in terms of building out charging stations for electric vehicles, the tax credits, which are available now for people who want to buy not just new EVs, but even used EVs, I think by themselves are going to change the, the portfolio of vehicles that are being well, sold. Well, they can make it affordable. No, and that's I'll what the tax one. credits are I, for. I can't afford $60,000 for, for a car. And, and I think you're going to see, because there's more competition now, because Ford and, and the American car manufacturers are getting into EVs in a big way, uh, Riveron, are you which is... At, are you mad at Tesla? I'm not a big fan of... Jeez, uh, no, because I, talk I don't about understand why. But, but talk about a guy who got government assistance and tax credits. I mean, Elon Musk has been eating with two forks when it comes to government help. And, and well, look what he's done, Joe. He made, no, and, and, he made NASA look foolish. Well, and I, I give him credit in terms of his space. I mean, I don't know uh, about no, going no, to Mars. SpaceX has been really um, an impressive accomplishment. I, I give him that. I don't like what he's done to Twitter. I think he, I think, and I, frankly, I don't think his shareholders should like it either because he's, he's wasted a heck of a lot of money in terms of doing that. And I think it's just his ego. Well, that try, to, him to, try, do that. try to get with him. I, 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 he's a good guy. Listen, you made it. Uh, I have friends who really like him. Remember Lon Seidman? He was my first yeah, campaign. Yeah. He loves Elon yeah. Musk. Well, so I, I, I'll tell him you're, you guys are on the same he, side. He, he, he's an amazing guy. I don't know about the Twitter <laughs> thing either, but uh, I don't know, but I don't even understand Twitter. This is a deal that you were you were involved with was Australia. Yep. Tell us, I mean, that seems like a boon, for, another boon for EV. Uh, it's a huge boon. EV. So um, Australia, uh, which is a great ally, uh, is a maritime country, has a small submarine fleet of uh, eight subs that are um, diesel electrics. They're getting old and, and um, they realize they've got a, they, you know, they want a Navy and, um, and subs are the best bang for their buck. They made a decision in 2021 to basically scrap their plans to do a new class of diesels and, and go with nuclear-powered submarines. So um, the U.S. has not shared our nuclear propulsion technology with another country since 1958. The last time we did it was with, with the U.K., with Great Britain. 
and it took almost 10 years for Winston Churchill and others to convince the Congress here to, to allow that, that transfer to take place. And it's obviously been a success because the British Navy and the U.S. Navy work together all the time. We have British subs that visit here in Groton, et cetera. So anyway, uh, but you know, for Australia, this is a much bigger leap. It's a country of only 26 million people, smaller than Texas. Um, they have no nuclear industry at all. They have no commercial nuclear industry. Um, and even though they've got a good sailors over there that, you know, for their submarine fleet, um, they don't have that proficiency in terms of doing that. So, um, so again, they're going to need help. Uh, but uh, to their credit, they're, they're putting money on the table to, to make this happen. And um, I actually was out in San Diego when President Biden and the Prime Minister of uh, Australia, Albanese, and the Prime Minister of the UK, uh, Great Britain, uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, were there, the three of them, to make the big announcement that they're going forward on this. And, um, you know, Congress, I'm working on bills to make this happen. The first three subs are going to be Virginia class subs. So, to your point, you know, General Dynamics is the general contractor for the Virginia program that's there. And that's one of the reasons why this hiring spree is going on because you know we're, we're going to obviously have to continue to build for our own navy we have the columbia class program which is that you know even bigger submarine program and then now you know we're, we're going to be in a place where we're going to be selling um and how soon is this going to happen early 2030s so legislation has already been passed uh, so the, the deal has already uh, been agreed to uh, we need to do some work on our end and my buddy Trent Kelly from Mississippi and I have been working together to get uh, language in this year's defense bill that would authorize these sales, authorize uh, Australian shipyard workers to come to the U.S. and learn the ropes. Um, and Kevin Graney and the guys at EB are, you know, what will welcome them with open arms. You know, but we've, there's some legal issues that you've got to deal with with the State Department in terms of people getting into the country. And... Um, uh, and, you know, I actually think it's a really fascinating, exciting uh, project in terms of, uh, and, and let me tell you something. I, I've been to Australia twice. I was just on a big Zoom conference there about a week or so ago. The people in Australia, they know about Groton, Connecticut. I mean, it's amazing how um, these we are. We don't call it Groton anymore, Joe. We call it New London. Okay, <laughs> all right, New London County, okay, and uh, but no, on, and I mean that sincerely. They 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 are very very familiar with what happens here, and and uh, when we had the USS Iowa christening back in June, we had four people from the Australian Embassy there as an admiral. I had them, I introduced them to the crowd, and they took a bow that was there, and um, you know we're gonna have a lot of Aussies in in the area. Joe Manny's giving me the evil eye here. Okay. He's telling me to wind it up. Okay. I'm a little scared of him, to be honest with you. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to, to comment on before? No, but you know, it was funny. On the same topic, uh, we had an Australian minister that came to visit EB uh, about a month or so ago. His name is Pat Conroy. His wife, by the way, her maiden name is Courtney. So we were trying to figure that all out there. Great guy. And anyway, we spent half a day together going around there. And I, when I was saying goodbye to him, um, you know, he says to me, he goes, you know, you have an amazing district. Like, and, and it was really, and he meant that, you know, really sincerely, which um, I really appreciated the fact that he said that because there's times you got to pinch yourself that um, this is a really pretty special place. And, Absolutely. And, and, um, and I feel very honored still to be able to represent it in Washington. I think we've got the best place in the world to live and work. And uh, I don't think we appreciate it. Well, this guy oh, just but, from, uh, you know, across yeah. the world. I mean, he's yeah. on the other side of the world. I mean, it, it, it jumped out at him. You know, um, if you get on School Street, which is off of Montauk Avenue, and you're looking at that huge building uh, that EB just built. Yep. What, I mean, what a, what a beautiful sight. But, Joe, I want to thank you. Um, before, I, before I thank you, though, do you ever relax <laughs> and, and, and have a pair of shorts on? And, I do. And, 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 yes. I mean, is Audrey still putting up... <laughs> She, she I mean, with this lifestyle that, that you, and God bless her. She's still working at Children's Hospital, and uh, she's. Hey, Joe, you you yeah. have a son and a daughter. What 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 did they end up doing? So my son works in New York City. He's got a nice job there with a data analytics firm, and my daughter's sort of making her way through, um, you know, graduate school 
kind of takes some time off and goes back in. So she's, she must be an hey, artist. She's one an artist. last question. Yeah. Um, border security. Yeah. Are you concerned with what's going on with all these uh, I am. illegal I mean, immigrants coming? Yeah, and I'm particularly concerned about fentanyl, you know, that's coming across the border yeah. there, which again, you caught, you talk to the local police departments around here, um, you know, it's it, it, it makes its way up here and it's that stuff is, you know, poison. And um, the one good thing, the fentanyl is coming over by vehicle. There's no question that the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Border Patrol, they all say the same thing. You know, the, the, but it's so condensed that it really small quantities that can make a ton of money, and it's very easy to hide. You know, when they're there. So, you know, in last year's budget, we put in a big investment in terms of new scanning um, technology there, and that is really increasing the apprehension of uh, fentanyl that's coming over there. And, um, and frankly, I would just put as much money as we could possibly do you know, to, to help with that because in my opinion, in terms of local impact, in terms of what's going on on the border, it's the fentanyl that's the, that, that's the biggest threat. Joe, Congressman Joe Courtney, thank you so much All for right. coming on. No. I love it when you come and we have a lot of fun. Okay, Murray. Thanks for watching the show today, Murray, I reporting. The city too tough to die in New London.